for this session, I want to share some of my current work, a book I'm working on called COG, as sort of a, a way of starting to tie things up for our final day, trying to give a sense of, for those uh, law school or grad school students among us who want to go into academia, some idea about how one particular guy goes about trying to find a topic and uh, delve into it, and also as a way of uh, thinking about the role of doctrine and where learning the law fits in to some of the ideas. There won't be much doctrine in this talk, as in previous talks, at least of mine, there has not. But that's not because it's not there. It's just, as we try to figure out over the span of a week what to put into the precious time we have, loading it up, we made some decisions about not trying to do uh, a, a, a survey course in patent, in copyright, in defamation law, et cetera, et cetera, even though all of these would be helpful. Uh, we're hoping that some of the other substantive courses are picking up on that. Anybody who's taken copyright with Terry, I think, can attest to the way in which that's done. Uh, and because I think all of us seek larger themes. All in the back of our minds, we're looking for answers to the law of the horse question that Easter book posed and that Larry focused upon us. Uh, so with that, let me tell you how I came upon this topic. First, I was intrigued by a study by a grad student at NYU named Casey Kinzer. She uh, did a rather unusual thing. She fashioned small cardboard robots, put a smiley face on them, put a flag on them indicating where they wanted to go, went to Radio Shack and got a motor that propelled them forward at a slow but constant rate. And then she released them on the streets of New York City. And to her surprise, many people intervened to help get the robots to where they wanted to go. So here, for example, is one chart of a robot's path through Washington Square Park as it started in the uh, northeast corner. And over 40 people intervened, complete strangers, to see it safely to its desired destination in the southwest corner. Now, like most NYU ITP projects, <laughs> my reaction first was, that's really interesting. My second reaction was like, what does it mean? And I'm not entirely sure I know, except that it bears some more than passing resemblance to internet routing. <laughs> it's like, hey, they're passing the laser pointer along. But it also says something about the topics that Yochai broached yesterday having to do with, you can get strangers to do things that are helpful to your cause without necessarily having to pay them. In fact, if you went up to people watching the screen, I'll give you a dollar if you move the robot, you might get lower participation rates than if you just let the robot race ipsa loquitur. So a lot of books have been made about some aspect of this new phenomenon facilitated by the internet, although in that case the robot didn't necessarily need the internet, in which people end up coming together to produce new things of the mind or to make something happen in the world. My favorite of these, I think, is Clay Shirky's uh, Here Comes Everybody. Last night I was uh, uh, talking with the I4BI group about the time that Clay actually didn't turn up for a conference. He was supposed to come up uh, and speak at. His plane got delayed or something. And I was subbed in as the alternate, which is never a good circumstance in a conference. Like, hi, I'm not William Shatner. but. Um, and uh, I did, so long as I could title the talk, Here Comes Everybody Except Clay Shirky. Um, so anyway, uh, my own book has a chapter devoted to Wikipedia and a form of cooperation, um, uh, a kind of qualitative analysis that uh, parts of which uh, resonated with yesterday's talk. And this was the cover that Yale University Press wanted to suggest for it. And I was not blown away by this cover, especially because John Palfrey and I had our book, Access Denied, coming out the same month. And it also featured a large hand saying stop on the cover. And it seemed like enough was enough with the hands. So they came back with this, which I also wasn't that excited about because I'm not sure what an American stoplight has to do with the book, except the word stop is in the title. And the 8-bit font is kind of annoying. But instead of just being a naysayer, I was like, wait a minute, my book is about, in part, the distributed intelligence of the net, 
why don't we have the net make the cover for the book? So I went to a site called worth1000.com, as in a picture is worth 1,000 words. This is a site that people visit and hang out at if they have really good Photoshop skills, of which there are many people, and nothing else to do. So there's tons of people on the, the site, and they engage in contests to see who can Photoshop the best photo according to a set of criteria. So I put up a contest for a couple hundred bucks, do the cover to my book. And I got several dozen entries for which this was the winner. It was from a guy named Ivo van der Int in Holland, whom I've never met and probably never will. And I liked it, although it did seem a little bit, say, Lesagonian in its apocalyptic uh, suggestion. So $50 over PayPal later, and that became the cover to the book. And I don't know, I thought it was better than the stoplight or the large hand saying stop. And I felt good about it. It's like, ah, yes, the medium is the message. Then I started thinking about the entire range of emerging platforms that let you attempt through a messy mix of incentives, extrinsic and intrinsic, to try to get help at a distance from any number of people as quickly as you need it. And I kind of, in my own mind, started to array it in a rough pyramid, that there were tasks that were really complicated, hard to do, requiring a lot of skill. We put those at the top of the pyramid. And they probably will cost a lot if money is the currency to try to get them done. Not that it always is, but if it is, it's going to be the costly tasks. Then as you move down the pyramid, you can get to tasks that are so easy to do, all you basically need to have is a pulse and maybe the markets would drive the costs of those tasks down and you can get a whole bunch of people ready to do those tasks. And now I just want to give a quick tour of this pyramid from top to bottom with some of the emerging platforms that still most people haven't even heard of and then start to share some worries about it despite the fact that it at least produced one book cover. At the very top of the pyramid, we might put the XPRIZE Foundation, founded by Silicon Valley entrepreneurs to spend the money that they want to give for the social good in an entrepreneurial way. They stake a prize like $10 million or $20 million to the first team of people that can land something on the moon, take some pictures, and bring it back. Or maybe stay there, I don't know. Uh, or to get a reusable launch vehicle up and back, or to invent a car that works on 150 miles per gallon. When they make these prizes, lots of teams come together to win them. They get one, and as they get one, they find out the money is leveraged. It turns out, actually, that more money gets spent by the teams to win the prize than the prize is worth, which turns out for society to be a pretty good deal. For the team that comes in second on the X Prize, it's less, but the point is to motivate activity around uh, a worthy social goal. If you actually read the fine print of the X Prize Foundation, in the frequently asked questions section it says, who owns the rights to what is produced for the X Prize? And the fact says, you do, applicant. If you read the fine print of the terms of service of the website, it says XPRIZE owns every submission that comes in to the site. These do not appear reconcilable. So I wrote to the XPRIZE people and was just like, meh? And they said they'd get back to me. They hadn't noticed the discrepancy, which is sort of weird. You'd think they'd have that part of the model worked out, and we have not yet heard back from them. I wrote them in August, so they're still thinking about it. I think their lawyer, who's also their chief financial officer, was on vacation. Um, I hope not in like a jurisdiction that, well, anyway, I was just thinking about money flows. Anyway, down the pyramid even further, Innocentive, which could have been introduced, and, and maybe even was, and I missed it, as an example of a new networked economy. This is from pharma giant Eli Lilly, a marketplace for people, but mostly firms, that have hard technical problems, not easily solvable in-house with their rather uh, uh, kind of ossified structure for employment. They've got some engineers on this and that, but they don't know the answer to a particular engineering problem. They can put it out on Innocentive for a bounty. So here's how they describe it. Companies, represented here by armless people, 
send money through a 1992 laptop to scientists arranged as it's a small world after all who then solve the challenges for the money that comes through their computers. Um, the most interesting and useful piece of the slide is the vernacular of seekers and solvers. So a company with a, with a problem is a seeker and if you think you can solve the problem you like have Photoshop and scientific skills and nothing to do you can be a solver. And the solvers gather in project rooms where they interact at arm's length with this anonymous company trying to give something worthy of the bounty that the company has offered for a solution. So this is an example, $20,000 to the first person that can solve the problem of browning in juice. Juice that's kind of outside, like one of these sessions, uh, not, we have the good stuff out there. We have the top shelf Tropicana. Um, times are still good at Harvard Law School. If the endowment went down just a tick, we'd get the from concentrate Tropicana and the translucent containers. And after a while, if it doesn't get drunk, it turns brown, even though it's perfectly esculent. So they actually um, have solved this problem so far. You may have noticed this by having bottles of that sort encapsulated from top to bottom completely by a label. So you can't see the color of the juice until you pour it out into a glass. And some company is looking for a deeper problem, uh, a solution to that. So if you have a solution, you offer it up to them. If they like it, they give you $20,000. And in exchange, you give them all right title and interest to that solution. You do not publish a scientific paper that says, at last, you know, Nobel Committee, take note, Brownian and Juice has been solved. Instead, it just gets solved in the background. And under the terms, you may not even be able to say that you worked on and successfully completed this project. Over in JetBlue, they made an amazing discovery of how to make their customer service reps work a little harder without having to pay them more. They sent them home and had them do their job from their home and issued them these JetBlue slippers, which you cannot buy online except on eBay from former JetBlue employees who'd been issued them which I think like mattresses, it's not clear there should be a second-hand market for these things. <laughs> but anyway, the CEO of JetBlue was wildly enthusiastic and pleasantly surprised when he saw the productivity increases from people being able to sit at home and work in their flying slippers rather than have to report to the boiler room. This establishes a niche in the pyramid for a generalized service of this sort. So for example, LiveOps is your contact center in the cloud. The story LiveOps tells is that in 2005, when Hurricane Katrina roared through New Orleans, the American Red Cross advertised a toll-free number to call if you needed help or had questions in or out of the city. The Red Cross agents were overwhelmed by calls. What did they do? They called LiveOps, which within 45 minutes had 10,000 extra people answering phones, hello, Red Cross, may I help you? Where were they? Not in a boiler room waiting for a hurricane. They were in slippers at their homes as live ops contractors who had earlier signed up to become a live ops contractor by running a gauntlet of automated tests. About 3,000 people a week start this gauntlet of tests, and they get winnowed down, kind of like taking the SAT. Is it the SAT? We were talking about this last night. It's adaptive. It asks you, or it's GRE is adaptive. It asks you different questions depending on your answers. And my idea, feature improvement, was a list of graduate schools on the right, and they vanish as you answer <laughs> questions wrong. And it's like, you know, damn, that cost me Michigan. So you do one of those tests here. And so, for example, here you're supposed to read the script out loud as many times as you like before calling in in your recording. Good, it's not the honor system. <laughs> you can read it out loud. Then you call and you make this recording about the mini oven and what you can get with it. You do your voice audition and they evaluate it. And they give you reading comprehension questions and they test your network connection. They figure out if you know how to use your headset. Out of the 3,000 people who apply each week, about 30 fall out the other side exhausted, ready to become live ops employees. I'm sorry, contractors. 
Very important distinction in the doctrine. An employee is somebody to whom you might owe health care benefits and withhold taxes and have respondeat superior. So when your employee screws up, you have screwed up as a company because a firm can only act but through people who are its employees. Contractors, on the other hand, I don't know why he put the drill in that part of the wall. Not my fault. He's a contractor. So live ops contractors then get hired, and here's the bid for them, calling all mompreneurs. You too can live in this hut of work at your house with your Diet Coke and your screens, and off here is a baby in a bassinet, and you get started on live ops, and step one is taking orders for Armando's Pizza, wherever that is. You get the script, you get the menu, hello, Armando's Pizza, how nice, you type it in, you hit send, it goes to Armando's Pizza, wherever it is. And if you do that enough and earn enough cred successfully being an agent, you level up. And at some point, you log into Live Ops, and now there's a new option on the screen. You can take drive through orders at Burger King somewhere. So you plug in, and they actually take the squawk box at the drive through uh, route, and they wire it up to your computer. So you hear the car drive up, and you're like, you know, and they say, can I have a Whopper? And you say, would you like fries with that? And you can say it with such elan because the fry elator is not overflowing for you. So you get to upsell them. You take the order. They're like, that was the nicest incomprehensible squawk box I've ever interacted with. Your order goes back to that restaurant 3,000 miles away, and they pick up the fries. And for the people inside the restaurant, at last, the last vestige of human contact that has been inconveniencing them has been removed. And they can just assemble the things as little tickets spit out, telling them, oh, Whopper fries, here, hand it out this window where a disembodied other hand will grasp it and take it from you. So all sorts of applications here for a generically flexible workforce that can be applied to almost anything that requires a little bit of intelligence on a task. Moving on down the pyramid, we have something like Sama Source, digital work for the next billion. The idea behind Sama Source when it was founded was there are people in refugee camps. They maybe have Nokia phones of the old variety, but those phones still have a screen, something can be displayed, buttons can be pressed. Can we think of tasks anywhere in the world for which the people in the camps could make progress on them for money by looking at those screens where the task is given and pushing numbers in response? Later it became, hey, let's set up a computer cluster, a computer lab in the middle of the camp, and they can come in and do some work. What does that work look like? For a good example of micro work, we turn closer to home, to Amazon's Mechanical Turk. That's 2011. Things are changing quickly. How many people have heard of Mechanical Turk? More than half, more than two-thirds, I'd say. How many people haven't heard of Mechanical Turk? Just a few left. This is an unusual group. If you were to ask even a bunch of CIOs, chief information officers, gathered for their chief information officer conference, like near a golf course, and ask them, how many have heard of Mechanical Turk? Almost no one. So I will make the explanation extremely quick. The idea behind Mechanical Turk is it's the 21st century, and yet we don't have jetpacks, and yet we don't have HAL 9000, the crazed AI, but it's really smart. Where is AI? AI just isn't good enough yet. So how about we have people play the part of the AI at just the right moment so that AI otherwise acts like a computer, but can feel like AI to the person using it. We call it artificial, artificial intelligence. Pretty interesting idea. Where does the name come from? The name comes after the famed Mechanical Turk of yore. We're talking 18th century. In the courts of Europe, this thing wheeled around the automaton that played a really mean game of chess. How did it do it? Kings and princes totally befuddled. I've never seen this before. How did it do it? You probably already guessed. There's a little person crammed into the Mechanical Turk in order to actually play chess. Which, just if you pause for one moment, it makes you wonder, Amazon is starting a new service. What will be the controlling metaphor for its ideal functioning? If everything goes swimmingly, this is what we are inventing. 
It's just rather a weird connection to the world's, I think, first digital sweatshop. So, um, all right, putting aside the metaphor, here's a sample Mechanical Turk task. Provide related keywords for these images. So you're here, and right, you can't help yourself. You're like, box, box, yes. You just earned a penny on your human intelligence task. And then the next one comes up. Trucks, trucks, yes, here's another penny. You're like, I like the odds on this slot machine. And you can sit there and label images all day long. They run lots of studies of demographics of Turkers, and at least in the early days, a large number of them, way disproportionately, were graduate students, which either reflects how poorly graduate students are paid when they're in the sciences, um, or perhaps it's just some of the only positive feedback you get over a multi-year period, which is a terrible indictment of our educational system. But in the meantime, we thought it actually might be useful while we continue this talk to charter a task on Mechanical Turk and see how well it works. So I have staked $50 of my own money for a task that Stephen is about to describe. What we're going to have a request that people do is visit an instance of the question tool I've set up. Um, it's people meaning Turkers, not Turkers, these not, right. not, uh, not our people. Um, you can see it. It's, it's called iTurk. It's, it'll be right below the IWA in that little drop down menu of the question tool. And um, they have to go post a question or a response. And then when they're done, copy and paste the text they have into the, uh, the mechanical Turk box for you know, quote unquote verification. And what's the question? Uh, it's just a. Post a generic question about the internet or answer somebody else's question. Post a generic question. No, generic sounds like. I mean, it's po post a question. Not, not generic, just post a question about the internet. Let's come up with an adjective for our 50 cents. All right. Damn it, they owe us an adjective. What kind of question do we want from them? Unusual question? Interesting question? Ridiculous question? That's, that's courting trouble. A what? A generative question. That's going to result in <laughs> weird things. Um, how about something, without identifying yourself, post a question that you have personally, based on something you have personally experienced or been touched by. I want to elicit stories rather than having them Google internet question take the result, highlight, and paste. Although it would be interesting to see the same question that is the top hit for that put in as the questions from all the Turkers. They can be very literalistic, which is both uh, a problem and a benefit, depending on what you want them to do. Does that make sense? Something that asks for a, a story of some kind from them, and I guess we have to tell them it need not be any more than X words. I don't know, 100 words, 200 words? But feel free to go on longer. All right, we're going to let you guys hit that in, and we will then revisit to see what comes out as uh, we do it. In the meantime, that's not a usual question unless it's coming from Aaron Shaw and social scientists using Mechanical Turk to elicit you know, ethnographies of the internet or something like that. But rather, um, here's another one. What's the difference between vanilla and French vanilla? Your answer must be between 50 and 60 words long. It can't be copied from anywhere. Just answer the question. You're like, well, who wants to know? I don't know. Why do they want to know? I don't know. Well, I guess I'm mildly curious myself now. But three cents to just answer the damn question and move on. In the kind of academic slash performance art category, I believe this is Aaron Koblin's work, um, a guy went about paying 50 cents, which is a lot in Amazon Mechanical Turk land, to people to write on a piece of paper why they do Mechanical Turk, take a picture of themselves and send it in, for which he could then make this honeycomb of people with their reasons. I, take to, I Turk for making money in my leisure time. I Turk for Christmas. I Turk to battle insomnia. I totally believe him. Um, <laughs> I Turk for drug money. Just kidding. I don't believe him. And, <laughs> This is really interesting because it shows you the whole point of Mechanical Turk is for you to never see these faces. In fact, you're not supposed to find out who a Turker is because it's a computer. A chip is a chip is a chip. These minds are fungible is the idea. And here he was able to show you that when you zoom in enough, what's inside 
is people. Which leads to another project down the street at MIT called Soylent, a word processor with a crowd inside. Now again, generationally, how many people know what Soylent is? Only about half of the room. It comes from the famed movie Soylent Green, as you can see, a musical comedy in which um, <laughs> Charlton Heston is a hard-boiled detective studying uh, this food product that everybody loves in this dystopian society called Soylent Green. It's a, it's a delicious little square, kind of like a, a small Pop-Tart. And uh, towards the end of the movie, he makes a, a, a somewhat astonishing discovery, for which I now owe you a spoiler alert. If you haven't yet watched Soylent Green and you're planning on it, avert your eyes and cover your ears because... Soylent Green is made out of people. <laughs> Very depressed Charlton Heston <laughs> when he figures this out. And he says, you have to tell them! Soylent Green is people! And uh, off he goes to uh, make his last contribution to society. So. Um, Another kind of bizarre metaphor transformed into Soylent, a word processor made out of people. So um, the idea is in Microsoft Word 2010, let's have an add-in for which one of the add-ins is Soylent and it's a button called Shorten. You highlight a paragraph, you click the Shorten button, and while you wait, over the course of about two minutes, the paragraph will intelligently, dare I say, magically Shorten itself. How many times have you been just on deadline? I mean, think about it. You're in an internet connected exam, but you've written there all your words, but you still remain 200 lousy words over the word limit. And you've been making contractions where you can, <laughs> getting rid of transitive verbs, that kind of thing. You know, turning the answer into something that no longer flows as an English sentence. And you're like, wait a minute, why don't I highlight and just press this Soylent button? Because, in fact, you don't even need to know what happens underneath. You don't know anything about Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk is a wholesale phenomenon for which software makers can tap it for raw human intelligence. is almost an uncountable. I need some intelligence, please. Go tap it and then offer it back at any juncture in a piece of software. It's just another resource for the software Hold on, tap. we have a question in the question Jonathan. tool. All right, a we have a winner. That's yeah. right. No, it's, it's pretty good because you need a human to ding to do the dinging for the five So votes. you ding. Well, I, I think maybe. Kendra. I, was, Kendra. I, I didn't actually want to say ding, but ding. We have a, a question in the question tool. Um, in the context of high unemployment, mines for sale type employment is not captured in employment statistics, neither in G or in GDP. Problem? Well. <laughs> It's a problem at a couple levels. One problem is, darn it, our numbers are not sufficiently high for GDP, which calls to mind uh, Vice President Cheney's ill-received, but I think accurate claim, you don't look at eBay. Remember they were telling him the economy was bad. He was like, but eBay, eBay, there's barter going on, which we're not taxing, though we probably should. Uh, and the barter represents GDP. GDP also a very weird phenomenon because you measure wealth by transfers of stuff among people, which means that if we were to suddenly discover utterly free energy, wow, microwave energy from the skies, no more oil needed, world GDP would completely plummet because you would no longer need to be buying that which could be freely given. Very strange sort of thing. Um, I don't know if that's the problem that the asker meant, that, that our GDP is not properly reflecting this as it gets more, or is there another problem the questioner had in mind? The questioner is named Matt somewhere. Matt? Is it Matt Noyes? Yes. Matt Noyes. I was really trying to test the question tool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Way to walk back from your question. Statistics. You were like, I had no idea others would find it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it is an important question that if, if new models of employment uh, yes. grow and extend, and as they're hired as contractors, yes. that's not considered employment. Um, yes. and, and so you're going to end up with a, a context where people are claiming unemployment when they're busy working as mechanical Ah, so it's not about the statistics overall will yeah. have the wrong number. It's that people will say they are unemployed when, in fact, they're going home and under the table working on something like live ops. It, exactly. And so really yes. the question is, is such uh, new economies of a large enough scale yes. that this matters? Yes. In a, which actually maps nicely to the eBay problem, too. It's the same thing. And I think one answer might be that 
we look to intermediaries. We have learned that trying to regulate the person at a distance, very difficult, even if you're going to try to penalize them for not, say, reporting that they are on live ops or on Mechanical Turk. Very difficult. Just like if you get something from Amazon in Massachusetts, 99% of the time you are not paying sales tax for complicated reasons having to do with a 1992 Supreme Court decision called Quill that basically says Amazon not having any physical presence in Massachusetts, just lobbing lots of shit in through UPS, sorry, stuff in through UPS, um, they don't exist in Massachusetts and they therefore can't be compelled as a matter of jurisdiction. They can't be compelled to collect sales tax on the sale. So you get stuff at a discount. And how is that supposed to be fair to Massachusetts vendors? Most of the answer is it's not. But uh, you are supposed to pay a corresponding use tax. We are each supposed to pay use tax on the stuff we buy for which we have not paid sales tax to Massachusetts. How many people have filled out their use tax checks within the past year? You did it once. It was a disaster. You actually paid money to the government. And you were just trying to be a good doobie, Dave? No, we had a, I don't know, identification who paid it. Microphone. They had an indemnification if you paid it. You pay it on your income tax form, there's a line yes. for it. They ended up sending it back to me as an overpayment and then charged me interest for not having paid it. And it took three months and 12 phone calls to straighten it out. I didn't do it after that. <laughs> but the original reason you did it was you said for the indemnity. You were afraid of getting chased for it with an audit or something. Yes. Even though that does not appear to have happened to a human in the history of Probably humankind. Not. My, my, I think it happens to yes. dentists a lot who like uh, get a buy. I'm not making this up. They order a lot of dental supplies from other places and they have DDS after their name so it's a big target painted on them. So you audit the dentist and you're like, have you been paying your use tax? And you get into business inputs and all sorts of stuff. Uh, Ken? Yeah, uh, um, I, I had an audit. So they did, they put a guy in my office for two weeks to see if he could find enough How stuff. did you win that lottery I to get a know. use tax and audit? He basically was a super sweet guy and he just hung out at Starbucks. He said, I just have to be here for a couple of weeks. And at the end he gave me a bill for 200 bucks that he said, I can't, I found this much. And he was, that was it. This but is I why America is in decline. Amazing. Yeah. Last point on this rather odd uh, tangent that Matt didn't even intend. Mike. California is going through the same thing. Uh, Amazon uh, was fighting with the state on whether it should uh, charge sales tax on its purchases. Yeah. And the state saying, but you have affiliates here. So Amazon just blanket shut down all of its affiliates in California. Yeah, remember there's the affiliates program. Some of you may be affiliates where if you provide a link to a page for anything on Amazon that someone clicks on, then you get a, a cut, I think 10% or up to 15% of, if it depends if it's a book or not. And so they say that's like having a brush salesman going door to door, that's a physical presence. And then they're like, well then, bye bye to all our affiliates. Jordy. Uh, I believe that Amazon in California settled yesterday and they're gonna start paying, uh, charging tax next year. Yeah. Wow, there are 49 other states and jurisdictions that are going to be paying close attention to that. We'll see if they can be as persuasive. 48, because they already do it in New York. They already do it in New York, because New York actually did the same maneuver, trying to call the affiliates brush salesmen. Yochai. Um, I want to make sure we don't uh, derail you too much from yes. a fascinating presentation. Yes. To not lose Matt's point in the tax yes. discussion. You, you, you've gone essentially both ways in this presentation, sometimes calling it sweatshop. Yes. Sometimes identifying some source as a potential source of income. And in Correct. this question of employment, I think this, th it's actually quite critical to see yes. whether we think of it as an entrepreneurial opportunity for people who really are contractors yes. working in seven different yes. frameworks or not, and what the implications are in terms of minimum wages, in terms of regulation of the terms and all of that. This is an amazing question. It's a deep question. It's one for which I do not have a satisfactory answer, which to me is why it's worth writing a book over. I hope to have one by the time the book is done. I'm interested in people's views on that. What I will offer here, as I get back to the presentation, are some threads, some instincts, some things that have me, I, I think the pluses of it are often self-evident. The ways in which having somebody freely engage in an, a pursuit, whether for money or not, that, in, that he or she enjoys, that 
is a presumption of like, life is good. We don't need to offer a justification for that. They're just actualizing themselves. So what I will start offering shortly are some threads that make me worry about it, organized roughly in two categories. One are worries having to do with the worker, if you can call them a worker, with the Turker, with the person whose knowledge or activity is being appropriated, such a harsh word, is being made use of, sometimes for money, sometimes not. And do we care about uh, that person in a way that we would be paternalistic about them in a regulatory fashion? The other category is what it might mean for society. That person is happily working away, it's just society may say, we don't want that to happen. And I'm gonna give a couple examples of that. And then we only leave hanging an answer to Matt's question, an enforcement question. How would you stop it if you chose to say it wasn't fair, you didn't like it, they owe their tax? And there we had gotten to the tax zone by saying, use tax, not a good way to do it. And that's where I go back to the intermediary. Could you go to Mechanical Turk and say, we need rosters of people. It has to be a real names policy like there is for reviews. We need rosters of Turkers. We need hours worked. And then we are going to assess you, Amazon, some task. Maybe we don't even need to know their names. We're just going to assert a tax on your transactions in order to make up for the income tax we're not collecting because they're not declaring it. That might be a way to do it so long as Turk is within reach. I don't know what Britain might have to say about all the British people using Mechanical Turk and they can't get to Amazon as a matter of jurisdiction in order to do the maneuver I just said. But also keep thinking about this because what's going to happen when the first law firm is working on an annual report for a client like Enron's Q4 annual report and it's just too long and some associate finds on the web this magic shorten button, installs it and uses it. And now something during a quiet period goes out to not just one. How does this get shortened? This gets shortened by about 20 people working simultaneously but at arm's length from one another. One, it's kind of like the three fates. One identifies the sentence to be cut, the other measures out how to do the sentence, and the third snips on either end. And the three faceless fates have made a decision about that sentence and it goes through. By the way, two minutes for a paragraph. How long does it take for 10 paragraphs? Two minutes, because you could just break any number of paragraphs into paragraphs and send them out to an unlimited number of mechanical Turkers waiting to shorten paragraphs. So you could shorten an entire book in two minutes using this tool. So there are companies springing up that are trying to at least deal with the problem that might come of exposing personal information by having it sent outside the firm to, <coughs> to random Turkers. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. That was a sympathy cough with whoever was coughing there. Um, they have taken, if you're scanning a handwritten form into typing, they have managed to disaggregate the form so that they will send Robert to one person to type in, Johnson to another person to type in, et cetera, et cetera, and that makes that information less sensitive when there's only chunks and nobody knows what the chunk actually applies to. That's a company called Microwork, or sorry, Microtask, and they have an interesting thing on their website. They say that in the future, computer games will play an important role in the distributed work industry. Microwork will be seamlessly integrated into online games. Instead of getting out a credit card to pay for a virtual cow, for example, players of Farmville could perform tiny game-like tasks, and they won't even feel like work at all. So you're playing a game, and the fun for you is the game, but while you're doing the game, you are helping somebody else out. This gets back to motivations. People like playing games. This is a real world virtualized game called Chore Wars, where as you do your chores in the real world, you earn experience points. So here's a chore warrior who um, earned 30 points, 13 gold in a food ration for cooking dinner, a somewhat gelatinous tofu cube stir fry. And that makes people want to do more chores because they kind of level up. They fill their passport. They get their boxes checked. Even Google News just introduced badges for reasons that baffled the technorati. But like, if you start looking at a lot of stories about basketball, you earn a basketball badge. And then you can earn the super basket. It's like, I'm going to read so many goddamn stories about basketball. <laughs> I am going to have, it's like, chill, OK? They're just badges. But people like their badges. And how do we know they like their badges? Once you have 150 million users, as Farmville does, you start doing A-B testing. Instead of trying to be Lamarckian about the evolution of the game, 
I'll bet they'd really like it if there were a lamb involved, a little lamb. Instead, you go Darwinian. Cycle through all known mammalian creatures. See what result among the subset of 150 million users gives you the greatest hit. Just like the A-B test we saw on the graph from Aaron Shaw yesterday of here's how people that care about badges edit, here's how people that don't edit. Hmm, what if they were to get a couple extra badges, the ones who care? How much dopamine can we get? That kind of thing would be, that was descriptive, but you could see doing the experiment. So Zynga does A-B testing to figure out this is, when you first sign up for Farmville, you have a mission. Your mission is to reunite this terrified, crying little lamb with its broken-hearted mother. And it has to navigate several obstacles. Now, it turns out this is a metaphor. You can't move the lamb around. You start farming. When you provide your email, the lamb moves to here. When you go ahead and like Farmville on Facebook, you get around the steel wool. Then if you play three days in a row, you cross the stream, and if you get five friends to help, you get around the rock, and the lamb is reunited. And there are people for whom it's like, I just want to have the lambs be happy. <laughs> and then you A, B it on how large the tier should be here, and it, it results in a weird form of AI making these games extremely compelling. Now, having a compelling game is a hard thing to argue about, although game designers hate Face, uh, Farmville and Facebook for reasons we won't go into. But you start seeing then ways in which you're not just getting people to play the game, you are eliciting work from them. So the brilliant computer scientist Louise von Ann at Carnegie Mellon in 2006 came up with a way of doing the image labeling task for which Mechanical Turk was paying a penny. And who was really paying that penny? The likes of Google, who have a bunch of images from the web that they want to label so that when you type in on image search, car, lots of cars appear. That's, you need a human for that, generally. So he invents the ESP game. It's a game Ding. you can play. Ding. Sorry. That's OK. This is not actually a question for Jay-Z, which is why I was hesitating. But uh, the question is, does fair use cover taking the Ken Burns Civil War mu music? And if anybody else wants to weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> So for our purposes, the answer is yes, clearly a fair use. And I think institutions like Harvard Law School or like Harvard University are paid up with ASCAP, just in case there should be a party on the quad where um, you have, uh, what's his name, hold up a boom box and play Say Anything. And you know, otherwise ASCAP would come around to be like UOS performance licenses, right? Another possible job, ASCAP auditor walk into bars, measure the size of the speakers and the screens, because as we all know under the Fairness and Music Licensing Act of 1998, any bar or restaurant of no more than 3,750 square feet, not including the parking lot, so long as the parking lot is used for parking purposes exclusively, may have no more than six speakers, four in any one rent room and two outdoors with which to play the radio. And if they meet all those qualifications, they get to play the radio for free without owing licensing. Break those restrictions, and they owe licensing fees. Hard fought battle between uh, ASCAP and the NRA on that, the National Restaurant Association. <laughs> so. But we, we truly digress at this point. So OK, here's how you play the ESP game. You see a picture. Somebody else on the internet that you will never know, that you don't know and you never will, sees the picture. And you start madly guessing what they're typing has this kind of Bayesian truth serum thing. It's not what do I think it is, it's what do I think they think it is. And when you both agree on what gets seen in the picture, you earn points. And the points, this is the version from 2006, start to fill up this thermometer from the wrong side, and you get points. <laughs> People really like points. What are the points good for? Nothing, absolutely nothing. But people like Ding. their points. Sorry. Ding, sorry. All right, so Lauren asks, the successfulness of money prizes in attracting entries may come in part from the lure of prestige and recognition or love of winning. How to separate these non-commercial motives from the profit motives? Does one need to separate them? For what purpose would one separate them? I guess if you're wanting to tax something, you can't tax prestige, but you can tax money. So maybe as a policymaker, you'd be interested in separating them. But 
So long as they're working, I guess if you're the business, you might want to separate them. So you know what you can get away with offering in prestige. Who here is a Yelp elite? Any Yelp elites among us? Nobody wants to admit it. Anybody a TripAdvisor elite? No, we're just a bunch of leeches in this room. <laughs> we read the reviews. Well, you can earn Yelp elite status. And I have talked to Yelp elites, and like, they are conflicted. Because at one point, they sought that status. And on the other point, they're just they're not sure they should be that happy about it. Um, so very complex dynamics uh, at work there. Yes? Also, there's, a, there's another question that just hit five votes. Um, which is anonymous. What about gold farmers for games like World of Warcraft in China? Same species of work as Mechanical Turk or something totally different? Good question. There's an amazing article about gold farming in China, I think by Julian DeBell. Um, and uh, the most amazing thing about this article is it has sweatshop-like qualities. They go to a physical location. They don't work from home. They go to this physical location and they farm gold all day. Now, by farming gold, we mean they have a little character that's an avatar that farms. This is something AI could do. In fact, in the early days of this, they created little AIs to go farm gold and then sell it to gamers who didn't want to bother to farm the gold. The game decreed that to be illegal and then had to figure out how to enforce it. How can you tell a person from a bot? How they did it? They had sheriffs go into the game, walk up to somebody farming and be like, how's it going? <laughs> and if the robot was just like, farm, 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 problem. And then so you'd have to sit there all day, farm the gold, and when somebody comes up like, how's it going? You're like, it's going very well. Why, thank you. Who won the 1969 World Series? May I ask you, Sheriff? And um, the most amazing thing, though, was for the people who farm the gold or level up other people's characters so that you can, for Christmas, give your kid a level 50 thing that he didn't have to earn, um, uh, those people play, leveling up the characters, then giving the password back to whoever paid them. And on their breaks, they play the game. And so it was just a sort of weird purgatory world. So I don't know how to think about it, but there's some great articles uh, on this subject. So all right, you're earning points by doing this. Louise has an amazing surprise. He finds that he was able to generate 4.1 million labels with 23,000 players, many of whom play for over 20 hours a week, earning points good for nothing. In fact, so many of the people earning points were coming from addresses ending in .edu <laughs> that his advisor made him put a 20 hour a week cap on those IP addresses with a message that says, get back to work on your thesis for those, a way of giving America a leg up over .ac.uk. So um, that's an incredible observation. And you start to see people just, they can get entranced. This was a piece of performance art that surprised its maker. It's a game called Waiting for Godot. And you can play the Waiting for Godot game. Um, it turns out not to have as much action as you might want. <laughs> Waiting for Godot has 99 levels. <laughs> I don't want to spoil the ending for you. They're all like this. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of people have played Waiting for Godot down to the 99th level. So there's some sense of curiosity as you're going, there's got to be a payoff. There's got to be a payoff. I can't wait. Does it it's reminiscent of, this is going to date me, the monster at the end of this book. Does anybody remember that from Sesame Street and Grover, the monster at the end of this? And he's terrified about what, finding out what the monster at the end of the book is going to be, and he's trying to keep you, the kid, from turning the pages. Well, there's a real surprise, and you find out who the monster at the end of the book is that I will not spoil. It's just too touching. Okay, so uh, he finds that 5,000 people playing simultaneously could label all images on Google in 30 days. And individual games in Yahoo and MSN that none of us has ever heard of easily average over 5,000 players at a time. Google takes note of this, and Google licenses the ESP game from Luis. Luis, in the meantime, starts a side business called Guap, Games with a Purpose, and any entity that needs a little bit of human intelligence, like Pandora wanting to label tunes with tags but not have to pay for it on Turk, they create a game. You're listening to this music. 
is it the same or different as some other person you'll never meet? And they're listening live too, and you start typing keywords, and they start typing keywords, and then one of you says, yes, this sounds like it's not the same, it's different. You earn 60 points. Notice that the thermometer is now three-dimensional, and most points today, JC, with 36,000 points. People love points. All right. Way to get a lot of work done without having to pay anybody. Now we get to a game that really tests my claims about the structure of the pyramid. Because this is a game that anybody can play. And if you win this game, you will have solved a problem that neither the game nor its makers knew how to solve. The problem is electronic design automation, EDA. It's a category of problem like how do we cram more transistors onto a chip ever tighter. One way to do it in designing that next chip is to have a computer try to do it. So each computer designs its more intelligent successor until you have Skynet. But that turns out to be hard to do because there are so many different ways to wire the chip. Computers are like, I don't know, why not just stand pat with what you have? You've got blackjack, enough is enough. They have found a way to map each possible way of positioning the transistor to a game. A game where you, the human, click on these rectangles and change them different colors. And as you click on them, it changes the balls in the middle to different colors. And as those balls are changing colors, it's representing different states of the chip. And there is some state that if you can click in the right way and get all of these balls to be green, it means that you will have found a way to make the chip tighter. Something of great value to the chip maker. And of great value to you, because you win points. So, here's hypothetical number one. It's a Saturday morning. Your little brother or sister or your kid is happily off the streets on a rainy day, in the room, not getting exposed to dangerous strangers on Facebook. Instead, he or she is on the PBS Kids site where he's been offered one of four delicious games to play. Suppose this is game number four. And your little friend, sibling, daughter, is clicking on boxes. Because it turns out that the enough human intuition as you start clicking gets you to solve the problem. People can get good at this even though they can't explain how they are good at it. Now, I'm just curious. I'm going to call for a hum in, in about five seconds. I want you to hum if this is something about which you have a problem. There's something that, that bothers you about it. One, two, three. Tentative, weak hum. If this is kind of just fine, like what's the big deal? Let me hear a hum. One, two, three. All right, so we have the just finers far outnumbering the people who have a problem. Given our timing, I'm not going to stop now and cold call people on uh, why they do or don't have a problem. Instead, I'm just going to bookmark this and ask you to hold the thought and hold the hum that you gave an answer while I lay out a couple more concerns. Here's one. Back to Innocentive. This is the Browning and Juice platform. But here's another task. They are seeking pyrazolopyridinal diazonines. They really want them. I don't know what pyrazolopyridinal diazonines do. It took me about a week to learn how to pronounce it. But you don't have to watch that many episodes of 24 to hypothesize what they could do or be used for, for which, hooray, we now have an anonymous, arm's length, perfectly oiled marketplace that pairs together heretofore unreachable buyers and sellers of dangerous chemicals. Right? Can you think of Perhaps, I, I don't know if I will be struck by lightning if I say this in the well of Harvard Law School's Austin North, there are sometimes markets that are too efficient. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> Yokai was defending me with this. <laughs> there are sometimes markets that are too efficient. And then we have to ask, well, geez, how are we going to regulate some mom and pop pyrazolopyridinal diazonine maker? Really? Are we going down this path? Is this like... 419 on Craigslist all over again? That's a question we'll have to answer. But even broader, this is uh, Rick Perry from Texas. He's been governor there a long time. In 2006, he set up webcams along the border with Mexico and asked people on the internet to watch them in case anything happened. 
thousands and thousands of people watched the webcams. And they had a button they could click that says, I see problems. Today, it's still up and running, actually. And you can go to this website and see all of the cameras in different. And it tells you, if you see persons on foot in this area carrying backpacks or bundles, please report this activity. And then you report, and they record, and they send out the patrol if enough reports come in. And now you have patriots watching the border, augmenting the thin resources of the police to look for undocumented immigrants. But why not generalize this to a platform? This is basically the fuzzy slippers for one particular thing, like JetBlue. Why not generalize it to this, Internet Eyes? This is a UK firm that seeks to take the highest number of closed circuit television cameras per capita in the world that currently are in private hands. They're watching a shop or they're on a corner and recording just to tape. So if something goes wrong, you can watch the tape later. Why not make that be live and have the unlimited number of people sitting on couches with nothing to do stare at your camera? This is what I really love. It's such British understatement. Earn reward money, have a chance at reducing crime, potentially become a hero and save lives. <laughs> the British just haven't mastered American puffery yet. This is actually version 1.0 of the site. Here's version 2.0. She's off the couch, wonderful Corbis image. I've seen it on billboards advertising other things. She's um, on the laptop looking. Here they are, ready to respond. And this is what I really love. Viewers register for free with no recurring fees. It costs you nothing to watch other people's cameras. <laughs> Tell me more. You'll have five alerts allocated to their account. The number of free alerts are limited to prevent system abuse. What happens when you hit an alert on a camera? It actually makes the mobile phone of the person with the camera get a text message that says, somebody just saw somebody in row five lift a Snickers bar. And then at the front of the shop, the person can be like, hey, you just lifted a Snickers bar. And the system pays for itself, especially because it only pays them bounties when they actually catch somebody. Otherwise, it's a free workforce. And there are people who put up a honeycomb of maybe two dozen cameras, like a bingo card, waiting for something to hit in any of the windows. And if things get a little too slow, you do what you do with the TSA. You put a fake gun in just to see if they're awake, right? <laughs> I've seen that robbery before, okay, robbery on 17, and then you collect your bounty. And the bounty, tell me, is this exploitation or not? Is it a lottery or not? I don't know. Here is jot down license plates of every car you see and send it in in real time with location. If by some amazing chance one of those cars is up for repossession, you win. The repo man gets the car, you collect a bounty. In the meantime, it's like having an unlimited number of scratch-off tickets. We just like scratch, 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 winner with a repo car. And they'll be like, I heard once somebody won on this. I'm just going to keep going. My ship will come in. His car will depart soon. Other bounty systems, this is from 2006, so it's version 1.0. At the University of Colorado on April 19th, does this date mean anything to anybody? No? April 20th. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking of the Nigerian scams, of 419 scams. April 20th. What does April 20th mean? Uh, <laughs> it's Weed Day and it's Hitler's birthday. So in a bizarre combination of memorial observance and celebration, People come together on April 20th to have the great smoke out on Farhan Field at the University of Colorado, and they say to the police, come on, guys, you can't arrest us all. And the police say, you're right, but we can take pictures of you all, put it up on the web, $50 to the first person who can tell us who this person is, and then we know how to arrest her. Now, this is probably the FBI's least most wanted, but that kind of tradition goes back for hundreds of years here, at least decades and decades. But then you start to see it's coming into its own. So for example, after the Vancouver riots, caused by a sports loss, but the, they seemed happy while they rioted. It's very puzzling. Here's a guy, like a totally nice guy. He seems kind of nice, setting someone else's shirt on fire in an attempt to blow up a police car. So somebody else set up a website. So it's like, do you know who this is? If you do, click the button and tell us, and we'll see to it that he loses, as happened, his lacrosse scholarship. I mean, it couldn't be more invented. He lost his lacrosse scholarship. And um, here's another guy. Um, 
talk about getting caught in the act. The newspaper box is in motion going against the car. You see him cheering it on as he pushes it, matched up by anonymous people to his Facebook profile. So like you can go, you can go friend him right now. <laughs> Share some good times, look in his album of that week and tag the photos, LOL. It's like amazing how much having the crowd out there can make a difference. And then you start to see the government of Iran catches on to this. So after election related unrest in Iran, here comes the website. Here are a bunch of protesters we can't identify. Please tell us if you know who any of them are. Now this is gonna have a natural limit because the people most likely to know who they are are the people least likely to turn them in because we know what's gonna happen. This isn't just vandalism or smoking weed. So hypothetical question. How, if I'm the government of Iran and I've got money but not much else, how can I identify these people? Well, what if we made a Mechanical Turk task? We take from the 72 million national ID card photos we have, we take the photos from each one, and we set up a bunch of tasks. Is the person on the left any of the people on the right? And we can have people in Beijing, in Bangalore, in Wichita, just doing, cranking through them like they would identifying the trucks or telling the difference between vanilla and French vanilla. At prevailing Mechanical Turk rates, you do the spreadsheet, it turns out about $16,000 will identify any arbitrary unknown person in a photo amidst 72 million possibilities. And I think there's something different there. Outsourcing isn't new. I suppose you could put it in a barge and send it off to India or the Philippines and have them sift through it. But the idea that, well, I don't know, just imagine, it's a Saturday morning. Your kid is happily occupied playing the concentration game. At the count of three, hum if you have a problem with that. One, two, three. Oh, you didn't even wait. At the count of three, hum if you don't have a problem with that. One, two, three. Oh, there's one hum. <laughs> Where are you, hardcore libertarian? <laughs> Will you step forward? There goes the hand. Yes, ma'am. Why not? Does it not only bother you, but are you deeply puzzled why you appear to be the only person not bothered? Yeah. Some of it might be social norm pressure. There's a silent majority of people supporting you saying, yeah. Because it must be that it reflects your view that the impact of what you do or the kid does is not morally reflected upon the kid. Guns don't kill people, bullets kill people. No, neither guns nor bullets kill people. Pe people squeezing triggers on guns kill people. Now, this was my attempt to turn the dial on the hypothetical to 11, to try to bring everybody on board, and then we could work through which pieces of the hypothetical are fair, unfair, plausible, unplausible. So of course, now I'm trying to figure out, is there anywhere I can turn the dial? I guess I might have to turn to Stanley Milgram or something. How about if your kid were offered 20 bucks to take out the legs of the kid next door? What's that? You're not okay with that. Good, all right, all right. We've just established. Then, of course, we would do, if we had the time, the doctrinal game of trying to sort out, is it because he's physically wielding it? Is the ignorance protecting him? If there were a disclosure that said, by the way, just so you know, every solution you do aims towards a more secure Iran, I don't know if that would change it. Is it the ignorance of the kid, or it's just the distance, the distance between the kid's act and the axe that falls. What's that? Fair enough, fair enough. And I, like, a huge thanks for stepping forward to offer up a view. This is what we're here to do. So as you can see, to me, the puzzle then is how to, to peel apart. Is it about kids, kids on PBS? Is it about well, our views about Iran? Does it end up being like, sure, anything can be used for ill, but why would you want to kill a platform that has so many good things too? Well, wait, who said anything about killing a platform? I wasn't talking about killing the platform. I'm starting to think about regulating it. 
Is this a cause for regulation? And in fact, as I think about regulating it, I find nearly every cyber law instinct I, I confess that I have for the past decade upended. Time and again on intellectual property, on defamation, on security. Generally, my academic attitude has been to say, lay off the intermediaries. We don't want to try to control intermediaries, even though they could be powerfully controlled and in turn pass that control on to their users. Let's have some safe harbors. Let's let the thing grow. Here, I find myself much more open to regulating the platform of Mechanical Turk or something. Now, hold that thought. I won't press you more on this question, but I do want to ask about um, another set of questions, which has to do sort of with you just have one role in a mosaic, but it's not your job to see what the overall mosaic is, which calls to mind, actually, the Harvard-Yale game of, I think it was 2004. This was uh, in Soldiers Field Stadium, where the Harvard Glee Club went up and down handing out um, uh, colored sheets. So it would be like the North Korean games, um, but, but shaggier. Um, colored sheets for people to hold up at the right moment to spell out a message to the Yaleys on the other side. And when the signal was given, it turns out it was the Yale Glee Club and not the Harvard Glee Club. <laughs> and the message that they ended up showing. <laughs> and there's just something weird about being such a part of something and you're so in it, you have no idea what it is and feeling betrayed by that. <laughs> feeling like next year, we're going to get you. And we start to see like review natmedtalk.com on your blog. This is a Turk task. You must review it. You can't disclose that it is a paid review. Doesn't have to be a good review, apparently. But by the way, Turkers don't get paid for what they do until the commissioner of the task says they get paid. So you might do a task, not get paid. You're like, wait, I did the task. What are you going to do, litigate over a penny? You could be earning pennies instead of litigating over a penny. So built into Amazon is this, I really want my task to be approved. And it turns out um, uh, that you then can get a lot of reviews that are good of natmedtalk.com. But just in case that's too subtle, here's one. Write a positive 5 out of 5 review for a product on a website. Use your best possible grammar. Write as if you own the product and are using it. Tell a story of why you bought it and how you're using it. And mark any other bad reviews as unhelpful on your way out. Wow. At last we have this Dr. Strangelove moment where one arm of the Amazon octopus has discovered the other arm of the Amazon octopus and they're trying to rip out the veracity of their reviews. And that's when you see things are starting to get profoundly weird out there. This, by the way, I think um, is for Zappos. Um, they don't ask for fake reviews. They take the existing reviews that are ungrammatical and therefore unpersuasive and simply have Turkers fix the grammar and then send them back again. Unfair deceptive trade practice? I don't know. You be the judge. But even worse, it's like this just in. Who knew uh, you could have um, online reviews be subverted? Fine, we kind of knew that. I guess I don't totally trust five stars if I'm going to buy a plasma TV on Amazon. But what happens when it goes into the real world? So here's lobby your member of the Ding. European Parliament. Ding. Sorry. And we're also running really low on time, but go ahead. Movement on the question tool to talk about the mechanical Turk responses to the thing we posted. And is that a subtle way of saying we're also near time and we don't want that to get lost? I wonder if I shouldn't, should I just end the presentation? Is it, I think maybe we should. All right. Jonathan, we cede some time from the next session. Right, Urs? All right. <laughs> All right, we're going to keep going. Um, but let's check in on the Mechanical Turk tool. Is there any way to do it on this screen, or we have to do it? Uh, or, oh, go to the question tool. Can, I wonder if this is going to work. Um, let's see. Oh, look at that. There's Oxford. So it's question slash what? Wait, for some reason. <laughs> you know what? I think we should have that music just play the whole time. <laughs> there we go. All right, iTurk. All right, we're going to look at them together now. 
I'm finding Google Chrome crashing. Are other people getting there? My computer is not properly on the internet. Has anybody gotten there? Oh, it's up on this screen. What do we have from the Turkers? How do you spot phishing emails? And are the answers coming from other Turkers or from us? Really? Fascinating. Good move, Stephen. So um, who made the first Facebook profile? What is the internet? <laughs> Sorry? Oh, it's up on the big screen. Thank you. How is Google Plus better than Facebook? It is not. Ha. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Should I mention an injury that kept me out of the workforce for a year when applying and interviewing for jobs? You just did. How to live in this competitive world. You know what? We should have asked them to also say what city they're from. Wouldn't it have been interesting to have this? Is, it too, are the, are all the money, is all the money spent? Uh, we'd have to commission another task, and I'd have to sell more. It would be a process at this point. So I'd have to put it in. All right, I hear a no. But I'm willing to put up another 50 bucks if you want to do it, but totally up to you. Why do we allow sexual predators out of prison in the United States? Why people prefer internet for everything. Can you reject the 50 cents for ones who ask irrelevant, silly questions like that? Yeah, Stephen, you're, you're approving the tasks, right? Well, or is it on auto-approve? At, at the end, it'll, it'll prove. I'm planning to approve all these guys. He's feeling generous. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. This is called an agency problem in corporations. Right, right now, it's still my money. Uh-huh. Do the satellites that fall in the ocean harm ocean life? What was the question we asked them again? <laughs> about the internet or not? Not about the internet. Ah, OK. So all right, we're just learning about what worries them. If I could ask Jesus anything and know I'd get an answer, what would I ask him? <laughs> Anonymous, you would ask him what to ask him. <laughs> Well, all right. Interesting. Any reactions to this or anything? I mean, we really should make it dynamic. I'm, I'll finish the presentation, but if you race, we could do an iterative task, if, if anybody can think in light of these answers of something that might be illuminating in some way to adapt the task for. Anybody? You know what? On our question tool, this is like make sure you're in the right IM window. <laughs> in, Is Mechanical Turk exploitative? And I, I think we have to alert them. There is no right or wrong answer to that question. We're not looking for anything. Yeah, does that seem fair? That seems fair. Is this going to pass IRB, Yochai? Uh, Ken Carson's a better person to ask. Isn't Ken he? Carson, is this going to pass IRB? Are we doing terrible things? No. You heard it. He said no. Wait, wait. Was that we a have no? indemnity. Was that a no it would pass IRB? I don't care. He said no. <laughs> All right, Stephen, if your game, it's on. Whatever she said. Nell, right? Yeah, whatever Nell said uh, about do you feel it's exploitative and tell us where you're from. And why. And why. That's going to cost us. So 50 bucks. 50 bucks. OK. All righty then. So back to this situation. Lobby, you're a member of the European Parliament. This happens all the time. Larry can tell us all about it. Somebody sets up a website designed to take you, citizen, if you live in something that resembles a republic or a democracy, every so often to write because that might make a representative have a view on something that will be responsive to you because they don't want to be voted out. That's the way in which the lower part of the first quadrant, the, uh, the upper left quadrant from yesterday, responds to the bottom left quadrant. OK, that's the basic format of lobbying. So here was something interesting that happened during the health care battles of the summer of 2009, was it? God, so long ago now. Summer of 2009, battles over the American Obama health care plan. Here's one of these sort of grassroots slash astroturf uh, groups, gethealthreformright.org, with a Corbis image of happy, diverse doctors. 
and they ask you to send this note to your senator saying that they basically shouldn't vote for health care reform. Now again, totally typical. This happens all the time. One extra element, though, from GetHealthReformRight.org. They went into Farmville, and they offered Farmville currency, good for objects in the Farmville world, if you would verifiably go in and write your real-world member of Congress against health care reform. And <clears throat> they got caught doing that and uh, promised an investigation. I've written several times asking what the results of the investigation were, and I have not received an answer. I, I clearly haven't paid enough. I need to up it to 25 cents. But um, they end up then able to, I mean, the only thing that make it more perfect is if it were the farm bill. <laughs> like, we're actually going to pay you in virtual carrots in order to oppose those vicious farm subsidies for real farmers. And people appear willing to do that for the money. And you start asking, well, what if it turns out that this phenomenon through the platforms we've been talking about could really become big? So, for example, if I wanted to convene a protest outside, I don't know, Harvard Law School, be better. I'm not inspired on my protests these days. But you could see there are platforms now where you could type in and say $25 to the first 30 people that show up with, in their own handwriting, lettered signs bearing the following messages, shouting the following slogans, bonus points if you get yourself on TV. And before you know it, boom, you have a flash mob protest around that topic. And now if you are the politician, you already long ago learned to disregard email as a weather vane for anything. Calls to your office, that still means something. Polling, that means something. Each of these things you use to gauge civic sentiment, now purchasable through what in effect are more efficient markets. I get a raft of phone calls. For all I know, they've been bought on a cash and carry arm's length basis. There's a protest at my town hall meeting. Who knows if it's real or fake? Can you imagine the First Amendment thing of, OK, if you really believe what you're saying, you have a constitutionally protected right to be here. However, if you're just doing it for the money, get out, and I'm throwing you out. I don't even know what the constitutionality of that would be. Probably under uh, Buckley v. Vallejo would be no problem at all. So you see a world where the authentic starts to give way to the market, and none of us can help ourselves with it. And it leads to a world that's really, really different from the one we have today. So here's an experiment they're doing at MIT, uh, enabling real-time crowd-powered interfaces. So this is actually a, a wonderfully harmless experiment, but really wonderful, where they take a series of photos or even a video. This is a 10-second video of themselves, and then they immediately farm it out to the Turkers to figure out which piece of the video makes for the most interesting picture. So instead of having to sit and pose for each photo, you just do a video of goofing off, and then you can imagine this all being built into the camera. Within 30 seconds, oh, that's quite all right. That's an extremely distressed. <laughs> Vera, your laptop is a sheep with a huge tear running down its cheek. Yes, yes. Somebody's battery went to critical, and you ran it all the way to the end. <laughs> anyway, you can start to see how the world will have little concierges and helpers at all time. Here, helping you on a fun task of finding the best photo. There, helping you as you're walking down the street. I'd like some people walking behind me, please. And you can do it. And in fact, you can imagine. This actually came out of last year's seminar of ideas for a better internet, although I'm not sure it's better. Um, this was an idea from one of our journalists as we were talking about these possibilities of an app called CrowdCam. You sign up for CrowdCam. When there's something newsworthy happening near you, CNN can ping your phone, can say, anybody within half a mile of this event, you'll get a dollar a minute to run over and hold your camera up and film it. And now they've got squads of reporters ready to give them feed. But why wait for something newsworthy? Maybe it turns out that I want to know who's going in and out of that reproductive health clinic. So I just specify a generic task for people. And there's actually, you can go and see, there's a thing called GigWalk. GigWalk, it turns out, is this. This was a hypothetical, but now it's not. There's GigWalk. 
you sign up for GigWalk, you're just walking around and your phone goes doo -doo -doo -doo. alert. There is a photo you could take that is worth 50 cents to somebody. Just turn to that building, take the photo, and keep walking. Hey, I want to keep a house under surveillance. If you're inside the house, what do you see? People walking by and continually taking pictures of you. And you come out and you shake one by the lapels. What are you doing? And they say, I don't know. I'm getting 50 cents. What are you doing? <laughs> They're not paying you to talk to me? <laughs> no, this is me actually talking to you. They're like, you are wasting good time and money. Go get paid to do something around here. For all I know, you could be taking a picture of me and earning money. Get with it, guy. This is what starts to get so strange. And what's the end point of this? As storage and networks get so cheap, the end point of this, this by the way is uh, in CrowdCam, you can direct the things a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. So you can see an entire arm like, you know, I'd like to teach the world to sing. The entire crowd goes like that to follow the news as the news director asks them to. But right, all you need is a hat. A hat that produces a continuous recorded live stream with audio and video of everything you perceive during the day. And you're just walking around experiencing the world and it gets banked on a server somewhere. And it's indexed, of course, through GPS to where you have been. Now we wait. And at some point, if retroactively somebody's like, wait a minute, who was walking through Harvard Yard at noon on that day? That could be the key to the entire case. You can question the cloud and say, among all the stored up footage, who was walking through Harvard Yard at that day and has something they can show us or that we could hear? What's the pitch to you wearing the hat? Earn money living your life. Just film everything and wait, and royalty checks will come rolling in as people out in the world make use of your footage for whatever purpose they say. And now when I think about privacy, when I think about intellectual property, I see that the current problems we've taken up as real and pressing, which indeed are real and pressing, are but the tip of the iceberg of what the technology is facilitating and for which I don't know where freedom is. Is it the freedom to wear a hat and record as you walk around in a public place? Or is it the freedom to walk around in a public place and not have that indexed, ready for uh, extraction by any party ready to write a check to do it? That to me is the future of minds for sale, where literally what's for sale is your head and your hat, <laughs> not necessarily even what's inside. We're starting to see movement towards this. This is another amazing research paper from Rice University. Theft caught in the background of a family photo. Although this particular photo was not taken with a smartphone, it exemplifies the opportunistic value of photos taken by others. Save everything, and at some point, we're going to catch a thief. And at the time we catch a thief, the people who made the software earn medals. We can't imagine the world without it. That's the kind of thing I see coming. Last worry I have. And this is a worry about cognitive dissonance. Because it actually draws from the story from yesterday. People's motivations are so complicated that in the 70s, before IRBs, they found that if you paid somebody nothing to do something, you might not get them to do it. If you paid them a lot to do something that had an ideological component, write an essay about why you like Barack Obama. If you pay them a lot, it doesn't change their attitudes about Barack Obama because they tell themselves it was for the money. There's just the right amount of money, though, that makes them write the essay, but then is low enough that they tell themselves later they must have written it because they liked Barack Obama, and attitudes about Barack Obama get higher, called cognitive dissonance theory. So this is being put to the test where there's a startup in New York that takes these regular CAPTCHAs, invented by Louise von Ann, and instead of just having to type a squishy word to prove you're a human, why not have to enter the following text? You go, Toyota, moving forward. And there's a banner ad that you are forced to put through your mind, and later you're like, I could really use a car. I need to move forward. Ah, Toyota, that's what I'll do. And you start to see, right? How do you feel the first time you get confronted with this? You have to type, Dr. Pepper, there's nothing like a pepper in order to like, I don't know, see the next article on the AP feed. Right? I don't know. Do you feel kind of like oogie? Is that the academic term for it, oogie? It's weird, but I think we'll get used to it in a heartbeat. And then at some point, it's like, yep, you can read the article. You just have to type that. And you're like, no, I'm a Republican. And you type it. 
And like, I'm making it sound bad, but hey, suppose we're talking about a developing world country and we want more vaccinations there because that's good for them and they should want more vaccinations there and their leaders want more vaccinations there. Why not pay people on Somasource to simply answer surveys about why vaccinations are so good and all about vaccinations and when they are done, their attitudes will be more pro-vaccination. Is it somehow less respectful of their autonomy to pay them to read and then answer with the quote right answers than it is to hand out a pamphlet that declares something to them? I think these are very deep questions for which we have only barely struck the surface at trying to answer. The Federal Trade Commission in 2009 put out guidelines that says if you blog or tweet because you were paid to endorse something and you don't disclose we consider that an unfair or deceptive trade practice. And the blogosphere and the Twitter sphere were like, that's ridiculous, government. Get your boot off us. How dare you tell us? How am I going to fit into 140 characters? This brought to you by Procter & Gamble. I think it's a great idea. Not because it's going to affect the behavior necessarily of any end user. We get into the end user problem we were talking about with Matt and taxes. But rather because it will allow us to go after the intermediary, to say to Amazon, wait a minute, that thing for natmedtalk.com that said you cannot disclose, that goes down. That is an unfair, deceptive trade practice. You, can, you actually have to make it say you must disclose. And Amazon might be in a position to do it. How could Amazon possibly screen the thousands of Turk tasks that are going on? Isn't that a huge burden for them? How are they supposed to police it? How do they do it? Turk. Mechanical Turk. Exactly. It's turtles all the way down. You have a Turk task to screen Turk tasks to make sure the Turk tasks are good. And all you need then is somebody to screen the Turk task to screen the Turk task. And then you're done. That's the kind of thing that I actually see. When I look at this world, my first view of Casey's experiment was, this is so cool. And by the time I'm done thinking through the worries, I'm like, what's inside the robot? Is it ticking? What's it for? Is this for FedEx? Are they finally going internet at FedEx? They're like, we're just going to do best efforts routing for your package. <laughs> We've left it in Washington Square Park, but we have every confidence it's going to get to where it wants to go. And if so, it's like, hey, I'm no sucker. I'm not going to route a package for FedEx without getting a little of the action. Or is it just a good turn for somebody? All of these questions start to come to bear in the innocence of this moment will necessarily be lost. Now, for every bad I can come up with, I see a good. When hurricane, uh, the hurricane, uh, sorry, the earthquake hit Haiti, I think then a tropical storm did, when the earthquake hit Haiti, there was a guy named Ben Rigby who ran a site called The Extraordinaries, which has a new name now, but it's still up and running. It's a micro labor site for nonprofits. Nonprofits put up tasks that were like Mechanical Turk tasks that would help them out, mailing label generation, who knows what and they offer no money for it because it's the extraordinaries. You are, as a Turker there, supposed to be doing it as a good cause. And they get lots of people who do it. I have been talking to Ben about the Iranian hypothetical of how to get a bunch of people to identify Iranian protesters through these micro-labor platforms, and he had been worried. He then thought of that after the earthquake and said, I'm going to build a site where people submit a photo of a missing person, then everybody can sort through the disaster images, and then we'll match them. He got tens of thousands of hits to this site, looking over several thousand photos, trying to match up missing people to people who had been seen afterwards alive in the Flickr and Reuters photo streams. And out of that, he got about 10 hot leads that looked like matches, which, hey, what's the, who would you, we don't care what the denominator is. That was all free work. We got out of that 10 hot leads. And that's exactly the process for which you would be, everybody would be proud to have a child doing it. It's a, certainly a warning that says we don't want to stop these technologies in their tracks given what they can do. Two more slides. This is one. Um, the most puzzling Mechanical Turk task I've seen. For 50 cents, do something kind and take a photo of it. You must do something nice, you take a photo, you send it in, you get 50 cents. And the author conceives of it as kind of a kind machine. People get put in through this funnel, the gears process them, and hearts come out the other side. <laughs> I really don't know what it is with metaphors and people who work in this field of human computing. They're all extremely lurid. But anyway, one 
way of looking at this is to say that the internet has at last achieved apotheosis. We have found a way to take arbitrary amounts of money and turn it into love. It doesn't get any better than that. The more you spend, the more kindness apparates in the world. The second way to look at it is, the next time somebody does something kind for me, are they like running around the corner to collect their money? Am I going to get a Mechanical Turk task that is accept a kindness from someone and thank them graciously? And at some point you're like, who are we? Like, are we just Sim City? Like, all of us? That kind of thing. Benjamin Franklin actually had this amazing diary. And one page of his diary is devoted to being reflective about his day. He says, he wakes up at 5 and asks the morning question, what good shall I do this day? Then he works, then he overlooks his accounts and dines, then he works, then the all-important four hours worth of putting things in their places, <laughs> supper, music, or diversion. Then he asks the evening question, what good have I done today? This is a man who felt he had a lot of affordances. He's like, hell, I'm a founding father. <laughs> like, you know, I'm about as powerful as it gets. I've got land, I've got me. But that day is one where he sets his agenda he is autonomous. I don't know how much the day in which, at any given moment, whatever you want to do will be measured against the strict opportunity cost of being able to earn money instead or having points hanging over your head that you want to do. You all know that feeling of waking up in the middle of the night and wanting to get one more round in against the boss on that upper level you couldn't hit. Right? Or is that just me? <laughs> You all know how it is when, on the margins, you could just stick around a little later and earn a little bit more, one more chapter kind of thing. I see a world in which we will soon be fighting over every minute of our time, and the battle is against an A-B test that makes that opportunity cost as dear as possible. Many of the economists among us call that freedom, and I am hard-pressed to disagree with them. It is empowering. It means somebody really can work 24-7 to benefit his or her family. I also see the ways in which, pick your tableau, people out on the park on a Saturday to picnic, people in a subway car. It's one thing to have them all kind of zoned out on iPods. It's another to imagine each of them working according to their own level of talent within the pyramid. Somebody on some XPRIZE project, somebody taking a call on Live Ops uh, for some kind of order, somebody else working on uh, a Mechanical Turk task, utter silence in the subway car as they're each doing their thing. This is a world that I would love to enter with our eyes open using the tools of social science, of law, of policy to be able to give ourselves a really good account of what lies ahead and if we don't like it, what to do about it. Thank you. John, thank you so much for offering time from your session, because I know we have gone madly, wildly over. Before we take a brief break, should we see what the uh, new task yielded? Well, the new, so, uh, it doesn't look good. They put a hold on my credit card. They put a hold on your credit card? <laughs> I had to actually get, how much, you had $50 left of? No, no, there, I guess I, because I've done a bunch of small payments over the day, it's, it's pending, they say it might take a day, I don't know. Damn it. Elizabeth Warren, right, okay. <laughs> All right, so we might still commission this task, and in an afternoon break, we can see what it yields. And this is just worth one note while we're uh, switching around too. You've now gotten a glimpse of something like Mechanical Turk. I've tried to show and not tell about it so that you really get some feeling of what it would be like to be a Turker, at least at a, a slice of life, and even, thanks to our uh, folks over here to be a requester. The next line to cross, which is a thin line, but it has some power over us, is to try it yourself. Pull out your credit card. Instead of paying $11.50, what's a movie go for these days? Do people go to movies anymore? They just stream them. But anyway, it might be worth a buck or two. 
put out a request on Mechanical Turk and see what happens. And the first time you do it and you see stuff happening in the world, just think about that. During this lecture, around the world, a couple dozen people drew away from what they were doing and did this because of some keys that he clacked on his keyboard. That's a power that is available to you right now if you want to play around with it. And I just urge you, not just for this specifically, but generally for the technology piece of things, cross that line. Try it out. It's really interesting out there. All right, should we break for uh, like five, seven minutes? John, what do you say? We're at 11.49 on my clock. Should we do 10 minutes? 10 minutes and we'll start, start at Start really at noon. Sounds Real good. Real noon. Great. All right. Real noon.